Good morning to my friends joining us here on the recording. It is April 3rd. We are doing our week number two online wrap up or technically uh, week 12. So, you know, we're going to talk about today are the action potential graph or the membrane potential graph along with those things called IPSPs and EPSPs. So we're going to dive in with that and start covering some material. So we're going to start on this picture here. Help me out in the chat for my friends here. Uh, remind me what page of your notes packet we have this version of the graph on. Where do I find this version of the graph? What page is this one on? Page four. Awesome. Okay, so we're on page four of the notes. In page four of the notes, we are looking at a, a more general look at what we call um, the action potential graph. Um, in, in other words, what you want to think about when you're looking at this graph here, what this graph actually shows me is all the ways a neuron's membrane charge changes after it receives a message. Big picture, what we would say this graph is showing me it is what happens from the moment a neuron receives a message to a neighbor neuron to pass on that message to when it gets back to normal, when it's waiting for its next message. So when I'm looking at my graph here, I've been telling students all week there are a few numbers that we want to make sure we know on this graph, uh, numbers in general that, that we know as it relates to the neuron. So the first number we need to make sure we know is negative 70 millivolts. Negative 70 millivolts. This is a must-know number for us. Negative 70 millivolts is the charge on a neuron's membrane when it's at rest. Or if you remember all the way back to lecture number four, way back at the beginning of the semester, we called this the resting membrane potential. It means that inside my neuron is different from outside my neuron. And just how different it is is that the inside is, uh, is 70 millivolts more negative than the outside is. So this is normal. We want to be down here at resting membrane potential, negative 70. When I'm down here, I'm listening to my environment to see what the cells around me are saying, what they, um, what kind of messages they're, they're sending to me. So the messages that neurons send, we see it here with a little lightning bolt right here. The message that neurons send to each other when they're talking, we have it labeled here as a stimulus. Now, help me out for my friends who, who've been to a couple other sessions this week or to everyone who's looked over the packet. There is a specific name for the type of chemicals that neurons use to send messages. What's the name of those chemicals that neurons use to send messages? Help me out in the chat. There we go. Yep, it's starting to pop up for me. That was a long word, right, that I made you type there. The kind of messages that neurons use to send each other, kind of chemicals they send, are called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters. So when I'm looking at my graph, my neuron is sitting around, it's waiting, it's got no messages when it's here at rest. When we see this point called stimulus applied, this stimulus applied point is the point when a neighboring neuron sends a neurotransmitter that neurotransmitter uh, has an effect on my, my neuron that's listening. Now here, let's do a little, a little sketching here. We are looking right now, let me draw for us, at a, we are looking at a little neuron right here. Here's my little neuron friend that we're looking at. This little neuron friend here that I'm looking at, he's, he's the one that, that makes this graph for me. When I say at this point on my graph that there was a stimulus applied, I'm saying that another neuron that lives in front of the one that we're watching on our graph here, I'm saying that another neuron was talking to, to my neuron here. So I'm gonna add some little red dots here to represent my neurotransmitters. At this point on the graph, when I say that there was a stimulus applied, what I mean is that this neuron right here spit out some neurotransmitters and gave those neurotransmitters to 
this, this neuron right here. This neuron is the one that I'm looking at its membrane charge. This is the one that I, I'm trying to figure out, are you going to send a message to somebody else or are you going to stay silent? Now, we had some terminology that was related to these two neurons. So let's do some terminology review to help us out here. We have a special name for the place where two neurons meet. This place where two neurons meet. What do I call this space right here? Two neurons meet to talk to each other. What's that location called? Yeah, very good. We're, we're chiming in that this location here is called the synapse. The synapse. A synapse is always where my neurons communicate with each other. They don't actually touch there, but they're really, really close to each other. So when one of them spits out a message like we see here, that message can be received by the other neuron that, that we're looking at here. Now, when I talk about these neurons, as opposed to just calling them one neuron and the other neuron, uh, I actually have technical names for them. And it has to do with their, their location compared to the synapse. So when I'm talking about the types of neurons that I see uh, in a chain, like we have one that's called the presynaptic neuron, and we have one that's called the postsynaptic neuron. When I'm looking at my picture right here with my two neurons, this one right here that I am looking at the graph of its membrane charge for, would I call this one right here the presynaptic neuron or the postsynaptic neuron? This one that I see here that I'm, I'm watching is membrane charge. Yeah, several of us are, are chiming in. I would call this neuron right here the postsynaptic neuron. This is my postsynaptic neuron. Post means after. So the postsynaptic neuron is the neuron that I find after the synapse, which means that the neuron I find before the synapse is called the presynaptic neuron. So anytime you're looking at this graph, and we're going to see it all over the homework. You're going to see it all over the upcoming exam. Recognize that you are looking at the membrane charge, what's happening with my postsynaptic neuron. Sometimes you'll see this in, in videos from earlier office hours this week. Sometimes I like to, to call these neurons, for the sake of simplicity and, and talking really fast, I like to call it neuron number one and neuron number two. We do need to know the technical names for these guys, right? That this is a presynaptic neuron and this is a postsynaptic neuron. Uh, but neuron number one, neuron number two, that's the fast way to talk about these neurons here. So this graph that I'm looking at, everything I see on here from, from resting membrane potential all the way up, all the way back down, all of these changes that I'm seeing in membrane charge are all what's happening in my postsynaptic neuron. So keep that in mind. When we say that we applied a stimulus here, I'm meaning that my presynaptic neurons spit out a neurotransmitter, and that neurotransmitter got all the way over the synaptic neuron. When that neurotransmitter gets to my postsynaptic neuron, it can have an effect on its membrane charge. And this is the, the other topic we wanted to talk about today, so we definitely will. The effect that that neurotransmitter has on my membrane charge can either be excitatory or inhibitory. The effect of a neurotransmitter on the membrane can be excitatory or inhibitory. The way that we see it on our graph right here, I received a neurotransmitter that made my membrane charge go up. When my membrane charge goes up, um, because I received a neurotransmitter, that would mean that it was an excitatory neurotransmitter. It made my membrane charge go higher. Because see, with my neurons, if a neuron is going to talk to its neighbor, we have to get all the way to the top of this graph. So for the postsynaptic neuron to be able to send a message to somebody else, we have to get its membrane charge all the way up to positive 30. So if I, have a, if I receive a message that is excitatory, that gets me excited, that makes my membrane charge go more positive, as my membrane charge goes more positive, I start to approach the next thing, the next number we need to know on that, this graph, 
The next number we need to know on this graph is negative 55. And negative 55 is that threshold value. Threshold is an underlined highlight star idea. If you remember from the meme that we started off with today, it says I don't always hit threshold, but when I do, I fire an action potential. This big spike in membrane charge here, that's an action potential. If I hit threshold, I am going to depolarize my membrane all the way up to positive 30. I am going to go talk to my neighbor. So when I add together these messages, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a minute, when I add together these messages, if I get to threshold, if my membrane charge gets to negative 55, I am going to depolarize my membrane or I am gonna make that cell all the way positive, all the way positive up to positive 30. At that point, I can talk to my neighbor. So we put a little text message bubble up here. When I get to positive 30, that's another number we gotta know on this graph. When I get to positive 30, my postsynaptic neuron can release neurotransmitters. That Those neurotransmitters are gonna to go to the neuron that lives after that and allows it to potentially talk to its neighbors. So at positive 30, my membrane charge, the word we use for that, my membrane is completely depolarized, or completely depolarized, because I used to be negative, oops, sorry about that, my, my internet reset itself there. Let me repeat a little bit of what I said in case, uh, in case it uh, got chopped off there. When I'm all the way up at positive 30, we say that the neuron is completely depolarized. It used to be negative 70, it used to be way negative inside. At this point on my graph, though, we are way positive on the inside. So we are depolarized. We're opposite of what we should be. So I send a message to my neighbor and then I realize, oh my gosh, I'm totally positive. I'm supposed to be totally negative. So we go back down through this process on the graph that they labeled voltage falls. I'm trying to get back to normal for where normal is. The problem is I, I'm coming down so fast, trying to get negative so fast, that I actually end up getting a little bit too negative. So one last number that we need to know on this graph down here, the last number we need to know that you'll have to add for yourself because it's not on there, is negative 75 millivolts. Negative 75 millivolts. Down here in the very bottom, where we've gone extra negative down here, this stage down here in, in a neuron's life cycle, this, this part of my graph is called hyper polarized, when my neuron is all the way down here at negative 75 millivolts, that neuron is hyperpolarized, meaning it's too negative. So my neuron is so good at going back to being negative that it gets a little bit too negative. Over time, I'll go from being hyperpolarized, where I'm too negative, back up to my normal resting membrane potential but that's gonna take me some time. I have to, to spend a little bit of time to get back to my normal resting membrane potential. So again, there are four numbers on this graph that we have to know. We, let's start, start here at the bottom. We gotta know negative 70. This is where a neuron normally starts. This is its normal membrane charge. If it receives a bunch of messages that, that cause its membrane charge on the inside to go all the way up to negative 55, at that point, we hit what's called threshold. And threshold is gonna make it so that we definitely freak out our membrane charge completely. We go all the way up to our next number we gotta know, which is positive 30. When I hit positive 30, I can send a message. Um, when I send that message, I'm done being positive. I wanna slide all the way back down to negative. Oops, I went a little too far the last number I need to know is negative 75. So this is a crash course in what the graph shows for you.
Sorry, guys. It, it died on me again. Um, I, I wasn't saying anything because I saw that it was dying. So, so what I said is if you can do me a favor, um, tell me what questions you still have about this graph. Um, or if you're feeling okay, give me a thumbs up. Okay, I'm getting several thumbs ups. I'm going to try to uh, to plug into the internet here, so bear with me. Hopefully I can stop these things where it keeps pausing on me. And Leslie, I see your comment that you're interested in the refractory period. Yes, definitely, and I, I can add mile into our list as well of what we want to talk about today. Okay. Well, here's what we'll do with this graph then. Since a lot of us are feeling okay about the graph, um, I just want to show you a couple other. Um, I did not, Nicole. I was waiting for you to get here. I didn't go over shapes yet. So I saved that for you. Um, let me go over a couple of quick things. We just talked about and labeled several things on the graph. Um, this is the exact same graph that you just saw, except this time there's no labels on this graph. So when I'm looking at this graph here, one of the things that um, you will need to be able to do for the homework and for the exam is to identify what we would call these parts of the graph. So let's do kind of a, a, a rapid fire round here, if you will. Let's see how much we remember. At the very beginning part of my graph right here, where my neuron is at its normal charge, what do I call the normal charge of a neuron? Which of these, these words over here is that normal charge? Yes, the resting one, resting membrane potential, absolutely. So on my graph here, when I'm looking at what I would call this part of my graph, we would call this part the resting membrane potential. Normal charge in, in normal circumstances here. Now at negative 55 millivolts, that was a number we had to know, negative 55 millivolts, what did I call that charge? That was another important charge. Yeah, that's my threshold. So when I hit this point on my graph, that is called threshold. Once I've hit threshold, I go through this process that I see spiking me up on this side of my graph. Because my membrane charge is getting more positive, my membrane charge getting more positive means it's depolarization. Depolarization. So on the left side of the graph, my cord is coming. Hopefully it will work for us. Uh, depolarization here on the left side of the graph when my membrane charge gets more positive. What did I call it when I was trying to get it back down more negative? What's it called when I'm going down more negative on this side over here? Yeah, a couple of us chiming in. This side over here on the right is, is the process of repolarization. I'm trying to get back to normal charge. Remember, I'm a little too good at, at repolarizing and getting back to my negative charge. I end up extra charged, which I would call hyper polarization hyper polarization okay, let me pause for a moment here my my tech guys here so turn turn this off do I should I disconnect or is it automatically gonna go bear with me guys we're gonna try to make it so I don't lose you again not connected It says we're connected, so I'll hope for the best, and I'll leave the Wi-Fi on in case it dies again. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Hopefully now I won't. Uh, yes, Leslie, that is my husband here to the rescue. He, we 
Um, he's working from home too, and so we uh, we we got a 50 foot Ethernet cord to connect to our our router. That's you know 50 feet away. So um, yes, that was my husband there. You just get to see all my family today. We saw my daughter. We saw my husband. So um, everybody's here except the cat. The cat would not want to be seen on on camera today. So. Um, Yes, I apologize about that. Okay, so yes, my adenine cat, that is her. Okay, so here's what we got. We got resting membrane potential, my normal membrane charge at the beginning. If I add together enough signals, um, I'm gonna go through the process of depolarization. Depolarization is when I shoot up my graph. My membrane charge gets much more positive. When I get all the way positive, I realize this is not right, I shouldn't be here, so I'm going to repolarize, go back down to being negative. When I get a little bit too negative, we call that hyperpolarized. Now, by process of elimination, you've probably figured out what we put at the very top of our graph. Up at the very top of our graph is where my neuron actually releases, so neurotransmitter release. At the very top of my graph, and my postsynaptic neuron, the neuron we were talking about, this is when my postsynaptic neuron spits out its neurotransmitters. Now I'm going to ask a question of, uh, especially of my friends who've been to office hours earlier this week. When we talk about spitting out neurotransmitters from a neuron, I can't spit them out from everywhere on the neuron. Not every place on my neuron has neurotransmitters. Does anyone remember from our, our office hours, I think we talked about this yesterday, actually, which part of a neuron actually spits out neurotransmitters? What's that part of a neuron called where it can release neurotransmitters to send to a friend? Does anyone happen to remember that part? I'll sketch us a little neuron here while we're typing. I'm telling you guys, I'm sad that we, we didn't get to do these, these lectures together in class because by the end of it, you all would be so good at, uh, at drawing neurons because we would be drawing neurons every day, all day, every day. So yeah, so there's a couple of different names that I call it. The, the part of, of my neuron that can actually spit out neurotransmitters is down here at the very end. So little guys that live down here at the end, there's a couple of names that, that we call them. In lecture, I like to call them the axon terminals because it's the end of an axon. So terminal being the end. Um, so the end of the axon, or what we call the axon terminal. Um, the axon terminals in lab, your lab packet from last week, we called this the synaptic knob um, or the synaptic terminal, the synaptic bulb. Yeah, there's, there's several different names for it. Um, it, it's just the fancy name for the structures here at the very end of my neuron. When my signal gets all the way down here to the end of this neuron, this is the only part of my neuron that spits out neurotransmitters. It doesn't make any sense for me up here for the axon to spit out neurotransmitters because there's other neurons for it to talk to right here. And it doesn't make any sense for my dendrites to spit out neurotransmitters. They're my receivers, not my talkers. So uh, the axon terminal is the only place on my neuron that I'm going to spit out neurotransmitters. But when I depolarize my membrane, when I hit this threshold value, and then I take this change in membrane char all the way from a place called the axon hillock that attaches the cell body to the axon, when I start changing my membrane charge here, and I send it all the way down here, like we can see. That's what an action potential is, freaking out the membrane charge everywhere. Everybody is going to go all the way up to positive 30, but unless you live down here at the axon terminals, you're not going to spit out neurotransmitters. Uh, I only spit out neurotransmitters down here at the end, at those axon terminals. So for everybody else that lives in the axon, that lives in the axon hillock, they're not going to release a neurotransmitter, but remember that label that we, we kind of put on this, this area before? We would say that this neuron is completely depolarized. Completely depolarized. So for everybody else besides the axon terminal, the only thing that, that really happens here when I hit positive 30 is my cell has an internal crisis and decides it's time to go back to being negative instead of being positive. But if I live down here those axon terminals, 
when I hit positive 30, I'm going to spit out my neurotransmitters. So we need to know on our graph the technical names, like we labeled here. The other thing we need to know on this graph is we need to know um, what kinds of ion channels are involved in making these things happen. To help us with the ion channels, I'm actually going to go back to one of the other things that, that somebody asked we talked about today, and that's the EPSPs and IPSPs. So before we go back and, and label channels on our graph, let me go right here. All right, so help me out in the lecture notes. We went back closer to the beginning now. What page are, are we looking at here when we talk about EPSPs and IPSPs with, with these pictures here? Can anyone find that? Okay, maybe hearing page six, page six of the notes packets. Okay, yeah, so page six is, is probably uh, where we're at here. A neuron receives a message. When it receives a neurotransmitter, remember that we said that neurotransmitters are a kind of chemical. Kind of chemical. So neurons are always spitting out neurotransmitters to talk to each other. They're always spitting out chemicals to talk to each other. Some of the chemicals that they spit out are going to send an excitatory message an excitatory message. An excitatory message is basically telling the neuron you're talking to. So a presynaptic neuron is telling a postsynaptic neuron, um, please talk to your neighbor. Please activate somebody else. Or in words that I used earlier this week, I've got some hot gossip that you gotta share. That's what an excitatory message is. When my presynaptic neuron spits out a neurotransmitter that's an excitatory, neurotransmitter it, it has the message in it you got to share this hot gossip it's got to go on some of our neurons though send inhibitory messages or inhibitory neurotransmitters the way that i equated that earlier this week is that inhibitory neurotransmitters uh, are kind of like uh this is a secret this is a secret don't tell anybody no talking to your neighbors so there are two kinds of messages that neurons give to each other they give to each other excitatory messages. Excitatory messages mean I want you to talk to another neuron. And inhibitory messages that say I don't want you to talk to a neuron. Let's see if we can remember what was the specific charge on the graph that we were just looking at. What was the specific charge that the neuron had to reach for it to be able to talk to its neighbor? What was that charge where we put that little text bubble on our graph? What charge does the membrane have to be at to release neurotransmitters? Has to be positive. Yep, and a couple of us are chiming in. It has to be positive 30. For a neuron to talking to its neighbor, that neuron's got to get all the way up to positive 30. Now, Nicole, I see where you're going with negative 55. Because, yes, if I, if I hit threshold, I'm going to get up to positive 30. Um, but the charge that I actually talk to my neighbor at is positive 30. The reason I mention that is because excitatory messages, their job is to make me more positive. Their job is to try to get me closer to positive 30. They won't me all the way to positive 30 because they don't have to. Uh, but their job is to get me closer to positive 30. So over here on the left, we are looking at what's called an excitatory postsynaptic potential. Big long name. I will never make you write that. And when you're studying, honestly, just study these guys as EPSPs. On the exam, I'm going to give you the words and then I'm going to put in parentheses EPSP because it's just way easier to see it like that. Here I go drawing my neurons again because I do love me some neurons. To break down this name, we need to remember that what we're talking about when we look at membrane charges is we are talking about two neurons that are talking to each other. The place that they're talking to each other right here is that synapse, right? 
Okay, so I look at the name of of this this change in my membrane charge here, right here. It's called postsynaptic. Postsynaptic. All that means for me, all it's telling me, is that the neuron I'm looking at, that I, I'm watching the change in membrane charge, is this one right here. Excitatory postsynaptic potential just means here's the effect that the neurotransmitter has on my postsynaptic neuron. Because remember, anytime we see this word potential on a graph, you are mentally changing it or even physically changing it in your notes to say charge. So an excitatory postsynaptic potential, excitatory postsynaptic potential is just a change in the membrane charge in my second neuron. Postsynaptic means the neuron that's receiving the message. So sorry, guys. It completely logged me out there. Can you give me a, uh, a a thumbs up or a wave if you you can see me again? We're back. Yes. Okay. I don't know what's up with my internet today, man. <laughs> it's it's really giving me trouble. So, okay. Um, let's try to pick up where we were. And again, I do apologize about that. Um, it's tired too. So true. Like it's it's Friday and it's like, come on. Like really, we're still we're still doing this online school thing. Unfortunately, computer. Yes, yes, we are. So, okay. So let me try to pick up where I think we were before dark here. So we were talking about excitatory postsynaptic potential. So excitatory means I want you to talk to your neighbor. Um, I want you to send this message on. And remember that we have to get our membrane positive to be able to send the message on. So an excitatory postsynaptic potential is, is something that changes my membrane charge and makes it more positive. You can see it on our little graph right here that the charge is going up. We got more positive. With us getting more positive, our goal is to hit that value that we talked about on the very first slide, right? Our goal is to get to the threshold. Because if I threshold, I'm going to go all the way up to positive 30 and I will be able to send a message. So an excitatory postsynaptic potential is any kind of change in membrane charge that makes me more positive. Maybe it makes me 5 millivolts more positive. Maybe it makes me 15 millivolts more positive. Anything that makes me more positive is always going to be an excitatory message that we see. We also have inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. I'm going to underline the postsynaptic word here just to emphasize it for us again. Remember that, that postsynaptic means that it's in my second neuron, that neuron that's listening. This time, the message that this neuron that's listening got was an inhibitory message. Kind of like, this is a secret or I want you to stop talking to your neighbors, that kind of thing. When I look at an IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, I'm looking at something that made my membrane charge go down. So I received a message 
that instead of making me more positive, which is the way I have to go to be able to talk to my neighbor, now instead of getting more positive, I got more negative. And if I get more negative, it's harder for me to get up to threshold. It's harder for me to get to the point where I can completely change my membrane charge and, and go and talk to my neighbor. So big picture, the difference between an EPSP and an IPSP, it really just comes down to, did you make my membrane charge more positive or did you make my membrane charge more negative? That's, that's what the difference between EPSP and IPSP is. Now let's do my favorite. I know I've already done this in office hours this week, but, but we're gonna do it again here. We are gonna draw for ourselves. So somewhere in your notes, if you haven't already drawn it this week, let's do it again. We're gonna draw for ourselves a big, nice, salty banana cell. We're gonna do our big, nice, salty banana cell. There's only so many ways I can ask these questions, so let's see if I can find a different way from earlier this week. Uh, when we talk about the salty banana cell, we have anions and cations that, um, that we use to make our cell a salty banana. What are the two cations that, that we care about when we're talking about a salty banana cell? What are the two cations? Okay, potassium is one of them. Yep, potassium is one. By the way, um, let's let's uh, make, add to this question here a cation. What's going on with a cation's charge again? Cations are, yep, there we go. I'm getting it in here. Cations are positive. Okay, so my two cations, we've got potassium and we've got sodium. We also have our friend chloride, but chloride has a negative charge. What's the name for an ion that has a negative charge? What are those ones with negative called? There we go. Yep, that's an anion with a negative charge. Okay, so when we talk about the salty banana, when we talk about, about our cells with its ion concentrations, we need to remember that the three ions that we care the most about in this cell are potassium, sodium, and chloride. So let's start here on the inside of my cell. Which of these ions lives inside the cell? Where do I have the most of inside? Yes, my K plus, my potassium. Lots of potassium, Ooh, plus sign. Lots of potassium inside, absolutely. Okay, tons of potassium inside, which means on the outside then, I've got a whole lot of my Na, my sodium, and I've got a whole lot of my Cl minus, my chloride on the outside of my cell. The reason we have to go back to the salty banana is because the way that my neurotransmitters make changes in the membrane charge is by opening up channels for these particular for these particular ions. So if you remember nothing else about the chemistry of a cell, this salty banana stuff, we gotta know this. Because I need to know if I open up a channel for sodium, if, if my neurotransmitter message opens up a channel for sodium, I need to know which way sodium wants to move. And if my neurotransmitter opens up a channel for chloride, I need to know which way that chloride's gonna move or which way potassium's gonna move. So uh, we need to add some arrows to our, our picture here then to show us if I open up a channel for this, which ways it's gonna move. Um, so somebody already chimed in saying in, what are my, my things or my thing that's gonna move in when I open up a channel for it? Who moves in of these three ions that, that we put here? Yeah, so, so my, my Na and my Cl, right? So it's gonna move in, and chloride's gonna move in. Cause see, here's the friendly reminder. We are talking about a channel protein that always takes things from high concentration to low concentration. They're always gonna go from where there's a lot to where there's a little. So I open up a sodium channel, and sodium's gonna rush inside. I open up a chloride channel, chloride's gonna rush inside. What's gonna happen if I open up a potassium channel? What's potassium gonna do? Where's it going? 
Yeah, potassium's going out. Potassium's leaving. Okay, so I've got three different ions that I care about, sodium, chloride, and potassium. I know that when I open gates for them, these gated channels for them, sodium and chloride come inside, potassium goes outside. The last thing I need to know with, with these guys is when they move, what do they do to my membrane charge? Because each of these different ions do different things to my membrane charge. Remember when we talk about the resting membrane potential, resting membrane potential, we're always looking at the inside. We always care about what's going on inside the cell. So when I ask you about the effect that sodium has on the membrane charge, would we say that sodium coming into the cell makes the cell more positive or more negative? What does sodium coming in do to my membrane charge? Does it get more positive or does it get more negative when sodium comes in? Some of us are processing. I've got a, a positive, I've got a cation here with a positive charge. When I bring positive charges into my cell, that is going to make the inside of my cell more positive. So inside becomes more positive. Or if we want to use that word that we put on, on the graph, we would say that sodium helps to depolarize, depolarize the membrane. It makes it more positive. So when sodium comes inside, the inside becomes more positive. My anatomy word for it becoming more positive is depolarize. Okay, let's compare that over here to chloride. Chloride has a negative charge. It's an anion. When I bring in something with a negative charge and I bring it into my cell, what's going to happen to my membrane charge? Is it going to become more positive or is it going to become more negative when I bring chloride in? Inside becomes more, absolutely, more negative. Not a trick question. I'm not asking tricky ones this morning. It's Friday, right? We can't do those tricky questions. Okay, so my inside is going to become more negative. To use our word from the graph, my inside is becoming more negative, but it's becoming extra negative. So I would say that when chloride comes into my cell, I am hyper polarizing the cell. I'm making it extra negative. So when chloride comes in, it hyper polarizes the cell. It makes it more negative. When sodium comes in, it depolarizes the cell. It makes it more positive. As close to a trick question as we're, we're going to get today it is going to be here when we talk about what potassium does. So you guys already told me that potassium leaves the cell because there's a whole lot of potassium inside and it wants to go outside. So potassium has a positive charge. That positive charge is leaving my cell, which basically means I'm subtracting it or I'm getting rid of it. Help me out here, especially my friends who've been to office hours this week. When potassium leaves my cell, what happens to the charge inside my cell? Does it get more positive or does it get more negative when potassium leaves? Yeah, inside ends up becoming more negative. We're doing subtraction. We're taking the few positives I had and I'm spitting them out. So we had five positives, now we got four positives, three positives, we become more negative. So this would be another one that we would say this kind of channel hyper polarizes the inside of my cell. It makes it more negative. Okay, let's do the icing on the cake here then. We just talked about on the previous slide, EPSPs and IPSPs. Remember that EPSPs and IPSPs are changes in membrane charge that 
are either going to make my membrane charge more positive or they're going to make it more negative. So if I spit out a neurotransmitter that attaches to a sodium channel, we said that sodium makes the, the cell become more positive or it depolarizes it. If I open a sodium channel, am I going to generate an EPSP or an IPSP? If I open a sodium channel, what am I going to generate in my cell? Yeah, a couple of us are chiming in here. If I open a sodium channel, that's going to generate an excitatory postsynaptic potential. It's going to make my membrane charge go up. It's going to be more positive. So when I open up a channel for sodium, I'm going to generate an excitatory postsynaptic potential. I'm, I'm going to bring in sodium to make me more positive. Hey, when I open up the channel for chloride, chloride makes me more negative. Which kind of SP are we going to do here? Is this an EPSP or an IPSP on chloride? When it makes me more negative, yeah, that's going to be my IPSP, right? When I open up a channel for chloride, I'm going to generate a change in my membrane charge that makes it more negative. I'm going to make an IPSP. And the same thing's going to happen down here with my potassium as well, IPSP. I'm going to make a, a change in my membrane charge that drops it, that makes it more negative. Okay, so here's why I made you guys learn the salty banana way back in unit one, right? You thought I was crazy. I, I was crazy. I still am crazy, right? Uh, but here's why we have to know that stuff. We need to know who lives where, where these ions are living. We need to know which way they move, and we need to know what they would do to my membrane charge. So our question, because I, I did see it pop up before, uh, Nicole had asked about which specific kind of channels are we opening up for sodium iodide and potassium. Uh, we are opening up channels that are not always open. When I talk about a channel that is not always open, what is the name for the, the general type of channels? What do I call it if a channel is not always open? That would be a uh, leakage channels actually are always open. Yeah, it's a gated channel. So the opposite of a leakage channel, my gated channels are the channels that are not always open. The channels for these ions are not always open. We open them with neurotransmitters, which is a type of chemical. So when, for all of these things that we just talked about here, for letting in all of these different ions, we are talking about opening up chemically gated ion channels. So chemically gated sodium channels chemically gated chloride channels, chemically gated potassium channels. For each of these different ions that we're talking about moving into or, or out of our cell, it is always chemically gated channels. So EPSPs and IPSPs, these small changes in membrane charge, that is always chemically gated, chemically gated channels. Hey, somebody help me out, because I know several of us have, have been to office hours this week. Uh, when I talk about hitting threshold, when I get to negative 55 millivolts, which kind of channels opens up at negative 55 millivolts? Not chemically gated anymore. What kind of channel opens up then? Yeah, absolutely right. When I hit threshold, once I hit threshold, that's when I open up my voltage gated channels. Because remember that my threshold charge was negative 55 millivolts instead of negative 70. When I have a voltage-gated channel, remember that voltage-gated channels, it's a problem with charge. So if I get that far away from normal, uh, my, my charge goes up to negative 55, I will start to open up voltage-gated channels. And Ariel's absolutely right. This specific kind of voltage-gated channels I'm going to use are going to be those sodium channels. So let me go back one more time. There's one more place in um, oh, that we have that graph. By the way, if you want to, if you didn't already write this stuff down, take a quick picture of it on your phone. 
it's about to go away because I'm going to pull up one last graph for us here. Okay. One last look at, um, oh no, it does show up on YouTube. Yes, Mary Lou, it does. It does. Um, I just like to warn people because it, it's not like I can go back to that whiteboard. So if somebody sent me a comment and they were like, Hey, can you go back to that stuff you just had written? It's like, uh, actually I can't. So, um, yeah, it'll be there on YouTube as well. So all of this stuff will show up on YouTube. You're, you're totally fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you're good. I, I would just hate for someone to, to comment two minutes later, like, Do, can you pull that back up? It's like, no, it erases it. It's gone. So, okay. Last thing we want to be able to do with this graph, because I told you guys, this graph is going to show up all over the place on, on your homework assignment and on, on the exam. Um, last thing we want to be, need to be able to do with this graph is to talk about which parts of the graph I use each of these kinds of channels on. So we just talked about our chemically gated channels. Uh, remind me with these chemically gated channels. Their name tells me that I use chemicals to open them. I'm going to make you type that long word again, right? What's, what's the name of the specific kind of chemicals that open up the chemically gated channels that we just talked about? The chemically gated sodium, chemically gated chloride, potassium. What chemicals open those guys up? Yeah, that big long word, right? Neurotransmitters. In the context of, of this chapter, when we're talking about chemically gated channels, the chemicals we are always talking about are neurotransmitters. So when I'm looking at my graph here and I want to know the, the part of the graph where chemicals or where neurotransmitters are involved, remember back when we were looking at the graph, um, we talked about the part that said stimulus received at the very beginning of your lab packet. The stimulus received was the neurotransmitter coming in. So when I'm labeling where on this graph, I see the effect of the chemically gated ion channels. That's going to be here at the very beginning. Chemically gated channels. Now, there are multiple types, right? We've got the sodium channels, we've got the chloride channels, and we've got the potassium channels. So I simplified it for you here on the picture, and we're just saying that all of my chemically gated channels are right here. Um, if we were to be more specific, this would be where I find chemically gated sodium channels and chemically gated potassium channels and chemically gated chloride channels. So this portion of my graph right here, those chemically gated channels. Hey, help me out. We've got this dotted line here, this purple dotted line. What was the name for this purple dotted line? The charge here is negative 55. What's the name for this, this special charge right here? What do I call negative 55 millivolts? Yes, this is threshold. Okay, at threshold, we, we mentioned this on, on our other slide there. At threshold, that's where I start to kick into having voltage gated channels open up. Now specifically at threshold, at negative 55 millivolts, my voltage gated sodium channels open up. We would say that here at threshold, this is the point on the graph where my voltage gated sodium channels get activated. Let me, let me label them on here. Voltage gated sodium. I'm going to be lazy, do a lot of abbreviations here. Voltage gated sodium channels. This is the point where they first open up for me. I got a good question earlier in the week, how we know that it's the sodium channels that open up here. It comes back to our discussion of the salty banana. Uh, because when I open up a channel for sodium, sodium rushes inside and sodium has a positive charge. Whatever kind of channel I open right here at threshold has to make my membrane charge go up. And the only kind of ion that I could move to make my membrane charge go up was sodium. So voltage gated sodium channels get activated right here. This is when I first open them. I will use those voltage gated channels all through this process over here on my graph as well. So the entire process of depolarizing my membrane, all of this is because of those voltage gated sodium channels. 
They open up at threshold. They stay open all the way until I get up here to positive 30. Because remember, when I'm all the way up at positive 30, I am as positive as I'm going to get. And my cell realizes, yeah, I probably shouldn't bring in any more sodium. We're, we're probably done with that. When I get to positive 30, there are two things that, that have to happen for me. The first thing that needs to happen for me is I need to open up the kind of ion channels that are going to help my membrane charge go back down. I need something that's going to repolarize my membrane. Our, our options here are calcium and potassium. Which of these two types of channels would I use to repolarize my membrane? To get it back down to its negative charge. Who knows what kind of channels would help me to get more negative? Is it the calcium or the potassium that gets me negative? Yeah, this, this one's a, a little bit trickier. We, we probably had to, had to study for this one here. Um, it is my voltage-gated potassium channels that are going to help me get my charge more negative. Potassium is more concentrated inside. Remember, which means it wants to leave the cell. It wants to subtract its positives. So voltage-gated potassium channels help me to bring my membrane charge back down. When I'm up here at positive 30, I do activate those voltage-gated potassium channels to start the process of repolarizing. We want to get our membrane charge back down to normal. Voltage-gated potassium channels help me to do that because they're going to spit out all kinds of positives. I used to be positive 30. Now I'll be positive 29, positive 28, 27, as I spit out all of these cations. I do, though, also, when I'm at this positive 30, I also activate my voltage-gated calcium channels. The voltage-gated calcium channels have nothing to do with membrane charge. I don't do anything with calcium. I don't use calcium to do anything related to charge. What I use calcium for is to help me spit out my neurotransmitters. So voltage-gated calcium channels are activated up here at positive 30 as well. These are going to help me to spit out, spit out my neurotransmitters. And I will say we spent a good amount of time in yesterday's office hours talking more about voltage-gated calcium and um, the synaptic terminal. So reference back to that recording to look for, for more information about calcium. So voltage-gated calcium channels activated up here, along with those voltage-gated potassium channels, because the job of voltage-gated potassium channels is to get my membrane charge back down to normal. But remember, we go a little too negative. That's what I see happening down here, where it's called hyperpolarization. The way that I'm going to get my membrane charge back to normal, I notice how slowly I get back to normal, right? It takes me a long time to get there. Uh, the way I get back to normal is using that last kind of ion channels that we have on our list, and those are our leakage channels. Leakage channels. Uh, remind me, leakage channels are or are not always open. Leakage channels are or are not always open. Yes. Yeah, they're leaky. Leaky, right? So they're always open. So leakage channels come to the rescue here a little bit at the end of, of my graph here. Their job is to slowly drip out um, or drip in ions that will get my balance right. So what they actually end up doing, all this potassium that we, we spit out super fast when we are, are repolarizing our membrane, they'll actually kind of slowly drip some of that back inside for us um, to get us back to our normal membrane charge. So leakage channels help me to uh, get my, my membrane charge back to resting membrane potential. They're involved here at the very end. All right, so I have a question that said, would it be right to say in general that the ions that bind to neurotransmitters are not just chemically gated? Um, so let me, let me say a quick, quick terminology thing here. Um, ions don't bind to neurotransmitters. We use neurotransmitters to open chemically gated channels. So we've got a channel protein that uses a neurotransmitter key 
that opens up the pathway for ions to come inside. So neurotransmitters don't actually attach to the ions. Um, they open up the door and the ions can move. So neurotransmitters only ever have an effect on chemically gated channels because they are a, a chemical key to open that kind of gate. Um, when we talk about voltage gated calcium channels or voltage gated sodium or potassium, all of those, it just has to do with the membrane charge. So the ions come in and they change whether it's positive or negative inside, that will open up the voltage gated channels. I'm not sure if that quite answered your question, Pilar, but if you can clarify what other questions you still have, I will we'll definitely talk about that. Ion channels that are open are the chemically gated plus the voltage. Okay, um, so, so what happens with these chemically gated channels is my chemical attaches just long enough to bring in a few ions to change my membrane charge. And then if you remember back from our discussion of muscle physiology, how acetylcholine came in and attached to the receptor and then the receptor let go of it and acetylcholine esterase chopped it up, right? Um, what we see happening here with these chemically gated channels is they open up briefly, they have an effect on the membrane charge, but then they're gone. They don't stay forever. So they bind at the beginning right here but if I hit threshold, they've probably left the chemically gated channel and aren't attached anymore because now it's all about what's happening with the membrane charge. So the chemicals don't stay attached forever. They attach for, a, for you know, a millisecond, probably just long enough to bring in ions. Then I'm going to chop up those neurotransmitters and wait to hear another message. So at this, this point on the graph, those chemically gated channels probably aren't open anymore because I've chopped up the neurotransmitters that were attached to them. The chemically gated channels are only open in this very short phase down here. If they made enough of a difference, they'll open up the voltage gated channels down here. Now, one of the questions that a couple of us had for today was about um, the refractory period. And that actually relates to these guys right here, voltage gated sodium channels. So let's talk about the refractory period and how it relates to these particular channels here. Uh, let me pull up another slide that shows us some information about the refractory period. By the way, for my friends who were in office hours yesterday, I, I fixed my graph. It's much bigger this time. So took a little time this morning to make sure we could actually read the graph. Uh, somebody help me out. We're going to be toward the end of the packet now. Um, where are we at? What page do you see information about the refractory period? Yes, you're welcome, Letty. Happy to make it bigger. Um, so for my friend who said 11, that might be the number in the old packet, maybe 15. I don't, I don't have the notes in front of me. Uh, regardless, we're looking for the refractory period here. Um, quick definition for us. The refractory period on a neuron, refractory period, is a period of time where it's hard to get another message. I'll, I'll phrase it that way. Hard to get another message. It's kind of like the way we all feel right now, right? Where we're, we're like half overwhelmed all the time, where we're constantly responding to messages. There are times in a neuron's lifetime where it can only receive one message at a time. Um, there are times in a neuron's lifetime that it can receive um, another message only if that message is strong. It has to do with the graph that we were just looking at. So the graph that you see in my picture here, it's a little bit different than how we've been looking at the graphs before, but we're doing the same general pattern. See how we've got our, our negative 70, our resting membrane potential, this neuron got a stimulus, meaning it got, um, it got a neurotransmitter, got a message, and then it shoots up. We're going to assume that message was really strong, makes the mountain go all the way up to positive 30 so it can talk to its neighbor, but then it shoots all the way back down. We get a little bit too negative down here because we got excited about going back to negative, and we end up back at normal. In general, the refractory period, it, it starts from the moment that a neuron gets 
it's a neurotransmitter, gets the message. It's going to go all the way until a neuron is back to resting membrane potential. So a good way to think about the refractory period is it includes any time when the neuron is not at resting membrane potential. It is easiest for a neuron to receive another message when it's at the normal charge that it's supposed to be at, when it's at rest. Why do we have, have this refractory period? Well, we have this refractory period because of the shapes of our channel proteins. So notice on my picture here we have labeled that sodium channels are open on this side of my graph. Remember, it's those voltage-gated sodium channels that are responsible for depolarizing over here. And we have labeled on my graph over here that the, the, cal uh, the potassium channels are open. These, again, are voltage-gated potassium channels. The problem is I use my voltage-gated sodium channels to depolarize my membrane. I use them to get all the way up to positive 30. If my, my channel that I use to depolarize my membrane is already open, I can't like extra open it. See, the idea with, with an action potential, sometimes they call an action potential all or nothing. All or nothing. Either we are rapidly depolarizing our membrane or we're staying down here at the bottom. We're not depolarizing at all. So all of my voltage-gated sodium channels are open when I'm doing depolarization. If you try to send me another message and that message was supposed to make my membrane charge go positive, it's already going positive. I can't, I, I can't go any faster. So that message is not heard at all. So we have this beginning part of the refractory period called the absolute refractory period. During the absolute refractory period, my voltage-gated sodium channels, the things that I use to depolarize my membrane to help me send a message, they're already being used. I can't, I can't use them again. So the absolute refractory period, I don't care how strong your message is. You can be yelling at me. I don't hear it. So my voltage-gated sodium channels are already open. I can't hear it. Notice that this absolute refractory period extends all the way down to about when we get close to the, the threshold value on a neuron. The, the thing that happens when my neuron gets to positive 30 is it stops um, having its, its, cal its sodium channel open and it actually gets that channel deactivated or, or it has a special protein plug that I'll show you that it puts in place because my neuron has this, this moment of clarity where it thinks, oh my gosh, I'm too positive. We can't do this anymore. So it actually puts a stopper or a plug in those voltage-gated sodium channels. And now my voltage-gated sodium channels can't let any more sodium inside. That sodium is stuck on the outside. That stopper plug is gonna stay in place, blocking the entrance of sodium all the way until we get closer to about the threshold value back down here. At this point, we're no longer in the absolute refractory period. And, and the way I talked about it in, in office hours yesterday was in the absolute refractory period, I can cannot, not, absolutely not receive any messages. No new messages coming through. I just can't, I can't even, can't do it. At this point, I transition into what's called the relative refractory period. During the relative refractory period, this is when my neuron was repolarizing, when it was trying to bring its membrane charge back down. Now, remember we talked about how I'm, I really want to get my membrane charge back down so badly that I actually get it a little too down. So I go into this hyperpolarized state down here where I'm extra negative. Remember for me to be able to, um, to send a message to my neighbor, my membrane charge has to go up we at least have to hit threshold, and we're going to have to get all the way up to positive 30 after threshold. Notice how we have labeled here that the potassium channels are open. These are the channels that are, are consistently lowering the membrane charge. So I'm spitting out positives, spitting out positives. I, I'm, I'm dropping down fast. Uh, it's kind of like you're in the process of um, – you're skydiving and you're just naturally going down, going down, going down, and someone wants you to try to go back up. 
without using a parachute, it's going to be really hard for us to do that. So my charge inside the membrane is dropping really, really fast, and then I'm really negative down here too. I'm extra negative. If you want to try to get me excited again, if you want me to try to hit threshold, it's possible, but you're going to have to work harder because either I'm actively getting more negative or I'm extra negative. Either way, we've got to literally dig out of this hole, this, this charge hole down here to get me up to, to my threshold value. It's harder work. So in the relative refractory period, I can receive another message. I can get ready to talk to my neighbor, but it's going to have to be a, a really big, a really strong, large message for me to be able to get out of the relative refractory period. The relative refractory period is not a problem with my sodium channels. The relative refractory period is a problem with those potassium channels. Either they're making me too negative or they've made me too negative. Maybe they've closed, but they made me way too negative. It's harder for me to hit threshold. So what we want to know about refractory period. First thing, during refractory period, it's really hard for me to receive another message. I am either in the process of reacting to the first message I got or I'm trying to get back to normal from that first message I got. The refractory period as a whole, I can't receive a new message. Or it's, at least it's not easy. During the absolute refractory period, zero messages. It's not going to happen. If you yell at me in the relative refractory period, I might be able to hear your message. It's still going to be a lot harder. But big picture, um, either it's, it's hard or impossible for a neuron to receive a message, a new message, um, during that refractory period. I had a question that I saw in here. Let me see what that is. Uh, Nicole asked when I was saying already open what that means. Uh, what that means is uh, on this part of my, my graph, my membrane potential graph here, we're looking at the stage where those voltage-gated sodium channels are opened up because of this message that I got right here. Say I have a neighbor neuron who, while I am at this point on my action potential graph, say my neighboring neuron thinks it's a good idea to send me a neurotransmitter when I'm right here on my graph. The problem is, even if that neurotransmitter opens up some chemically gated sodium channels that try to make my membrane charge look more positive, the problem is that membrane charge is already shooting straight up. My voltage-gated sodium channels are open because of this stimulus. So if I got another stimulus right here, if another neuron decided to give me another stimulus right here, I'm going to ignore it because I can't, I can't do anything about it. I'm already responding to my first stimulus. If you send me another stimulus here or you send me a stimulus here or a stimulus here, all of these points on the graph, I can't respond to it at all, period. You send me a stimulus here, you send me a stimulus here or here, I could respond to those if it's strong enough to overcome the fact that I'm, I'm spitting out my positives or to overcome the fact that, that my, um, my membrane charge is extra negative. So already open is a way for me to say that I'm, all, I'm still responding to my first stimulus. If you give me another stimulus, I can't do anything about it. We paired this graph with this picture. So this picture that you're seeing here shows me what it looks like um, when we're talking about our, our sodium channels, the three shapes that they can be in. So up here on the left is the graph that we were looking at before. We've got that absolute refractory period right here, shown in green. We've got the relative refractory period shown here in blue. My voltage-gated sodium channels are most responsible for this absolute refractory period. And let me show you why. In your notes, it might not be a bad idea for you to um, underline, highlight, star, or circle this shape of my voltage-gated sodium channel right here. This shape of my voltage-gated sodium channel, this is the only shape that that channel can be in if I'm going to receive a new stimulus. My voltage-gated sodium channel needs to not be already transporting sodium in, like I see over here, and it needs to not be inactivated, like I see over here. I need that voltage-gated sodium channel closed 
because this is the channel that's going to help me to spike up my membrane charge. So any time on my graph when the voltage-gated sodium channel doesn't look like this, when it's not closed and waiting to receive a message, if I'm in any other shape, I can't do my job. There's no more messages coming in. So the part of our graph called depolarization, the part of our graph where it's, it's shooting up its membrane charge really fast, the way that the, this channel looks when it's shooting up its membrane charge really fast is sodium ions are rushing through this channel. And that this channel is open when I'm doing the process of depolarization. When I get up here to the peak, at this peak is when um, I, I put in, we called it yesterday, the ball and chain protein, or kind of like a stopper in a bathtub. When I get to positive 30, this little ball and chain protein that hangs underneath the voltage-gated sodium channel, it freaks out and folds inside the channel. It basically tells the channel, you did a bad thing here. We are positive 30. We are done. I'm cutting you off. So my neuron, uh, so my voltage-gated sodium channel stays in this shape from this point up here, the peak of my depolarized, all the way down, remember, until about threshold. At about threshold, this little stopper will move back out of the way. It says, okay, we're almost normal again. I'll move out of the way. The protein channel closes again. And this is why, why we then enter this relative recovery period. So the two parts are the two shapes that the sodium channel can be in that are a problem for me. When it's already open, I can't reopen them, so I can't respond again. And when I've got this stopper in it, I, I can't open it again either because the stopper is blocking it. These bottom two are the two shapes that the voltage-gated sodium channel takes on during this absolute refractory period. And that's the reason why I absolutely cannot receive a message during that time. I need to know what questions we still have or give me a thumbs up if we feel okay. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that helped you, Nicole. Glad to hear that. I know it's Friday. Am I going to get any uh, any dancing emojis on Friday? I might get some dancing emojis on Friday at the end of our session, right? When we're all when we're all done. I will take a thumbs up. Yep. Thumbs up is good. Any any other questions about these sodium channels? Well, here I'll give you a, uh, a meme here. This is the meme that I was like, oh, man, I really should have showed this yesterday. So here we go. This is the one I'm most proud of. I don't know if you guys are ready for this. Here we go. This is pretty legit right here. Now that we just talked the life out of the absolute refractory period, my meme says we cannot make a new action potential during the absolute refractory period. One does not semiconduct an action potential in the absolute refractory period. So for a couple of us who, who like this kind of meme, I, I found that one for us too. I was, I was particularly proud of that one. That one was, was pretty exciting for me. So um, big idea, when we are in the absolute refractory period, like this says, we definitely are not doing an action potential. When we're in the relative refractory period, May could build an action potential, which, by the way, is just that graph spiking up. An action potential is how I'm going to send a message. So I cannot get up to the top. I can't build an action potential when I'm in the absolute refractory period. When I'm in the relative refractory period, if I work hard enough, I probably could. But it, it, it's, it's hard. I usually have to wait till I'm back to, to rest and remember and potential. <coughs> Pilar asks, at threshold and down, the sodium channels are back to their closed position. That is correct. Yeah, from about threshold, uh, give or take, because that stopper protein is voltage sensitive. So we get to about threshold. At that point and below, the sodium channels are ready, but now the potassium channels are giving me trouble. So that, that's why I have that relative refractory period. Okay, well, the one other thing that I know uh, 
um, I got some questions on was myelin. So I'll talk a little bit more about myelin today. Um, I did talk about myelin yesterday as well. So let's talk a little bit about myelin. Uh, let me check out my slides here. Perfect. We'll start here. Here's a, a lab reminder for us uh, that myelin is the fatty substance that I find wrapping around the axon of my neurons. So the myelin wraps around them. Remember that an axon is the place where I send my message from the cell all the way down uh, through the axon to those axon terminals where they're going to share that message with their neighbor. Um, the goal of myelin is kind of twofold. Myelin wants to make sure my message goes as quickly as possible. Myelin also wants to make sure that my message doesn't get messed up or garbled. Um, yesterday, someone used the analogy of static. Um, myelin helps to prevent the static so that we can hear the message clearly. I really liked that idea there. So myelin wrapping around the axon of, of my neurons. Myelin helps us to send those messages quicker and to, to keep them safe. Uh, in a couple of different ways. So um, let's start by looking at this picture here. Help me out again. Um, what page of our notes are we on here with our, our myelin pictures? We're probably like way by the end here with, with myelin, way at the end of the packet. We're scouring. Where do I have my pictures of myelinated neurons? Okay. Sounding like it's it's about page 17. So there, there toward the very end of your packet with, with myelin there. So we have two options for, for neurons in the body. Many of the neurons in your body have this myelin sheath wrapping around them. So have this fatty substance that insulates the neuron to, to keep it safe, to help it send its messages quickly. We do have some neurons in the body though that do not have a myelin sheath. So when you look at their axon, that axon is bare. Um, places on the axon that are exposed to the environment are going to have to have ion channels on them. Those ion channels are the kinds of ions that, that we've been talking about today. So the two kinds of voltage-gated ion channels that we're going to find all along the axon of neuron are going to be the sodium channels, and it's going to be those potassium channels as well. So all along, when we, when we use this terminology here that it's voltage-gated ion channels, keep in mind that the types of voltage-gated ion channels we're talking about, um, that, that's going to be these voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels. If uh, I, I do not have myelin, like this first neuron that I'm looking at up here, if I don't have myelin, all of the surface of my axon is exposed to the environment around me. Because all of the axon is exposed to the environment around me, that means I am going to have a whole lot of leakage channels, oops, spell them right, leakage channels that are constantly exposed to the environment. Because the, the membranes of all of your cells have a bunch of these leakage channels. So we have labeled on our picture the places where we have all of the voltage-gated ion channels. You can see those. But imagine in all of these little spaces where there's this other blue color that this is the location of leakage channels. And let's remind ourselves here, leakage channels are or are not always open. Leakage channels are or are not always open. Leakage channels are always open. Uh, with the leakage channels then, that makes it a little bit problematic when I'm trying to make my membrane charge so different. So we start at negative 70, and we want to go all the way up to positive 30, and then we want to go back down. That's what happens on our membrane charge graph. That's how the charge changes. We do that by rushing in our sodium, by rushing out potassium, all those kind of things. The problem is leakage channels are always open and they're always taking stuff from high concentration to low concentration. So everywhere that I have leakage channels, they're naturally going to bring in a little bit of sodium, because remember there's a bunch of sodium outside, not as much inside. Leakage channels say, oh, I can bring in some sodium for you. I'll take care of that. And 
all along the membrane, I also have leakage channels for potassium. And they're saying, oh, there's a whole lot of potassium inside. I can leak some outside for you. If I'm trying to make my sodium rush in as quickly as possible, or I'm trying to make my potassium rush out as quickly as possible, having these leakage channels is a problem for me. Because remember, here, let's tie this back into a unit one word. We had a word that described when my concentration inside a cell was the same as my concentration outside a cell. Does anyone remember what that, that, that word was for the same concentration? Yeah, a couple of us are chiming in. It was one of those, I call them the tonic words, the concentration words. Leakage channels, we said the goal of leakage channels and the goal of passive transport, stuff that doesn't take energy, the goal is to make things isotonic. Isotonic. Iso means the same. So the same concentration. Same concentration. Leakage channels want to make the inside and the outside the same concentration. So they're going to leak in some sodium. They're going to leak out some potassium. The closer the inside and the outside of my, my neuron are to each other, the closer their concentration is, the slower it's going to be when I open up a voltage-gated channel hoping to rush in a bunch of these ions. If their, their difference in concentration isn't that high, they're not going to rush in very quickly. So all along this space that I see here on my membrane, I've got these leakage channels that are, are basically muddying the water, if you will. They're pulling in some extra sodium for me. They're spitting out some extra potassium. They're making it so that when these voltage-gated channels get activated, it, there's not as much sodium for them to pull inside, or there's not as much potassium for them to, to spit back outside. So what ends up happening if I don't have myelin to cover any of, of the membrane, um, what ends up happening is see this big part of my line right here, this is when I first generate action potential, when I first make my membrane charge positive 30. All of my membrane along here needs to get to positive 30. We're going to make all of the membrane from beginning to end get to positive 30. The problem is when I'm leaking ions in between these voltage-gated channels, notice how my signal goes from being really strong to really weak or much weaker very quickly. The, the space between, uh, from when I made that message to as I travel and it gets weaker, it's very short. That's because these leakage channels are, are pulling in sodium, they're spitting out potassium, they're making it harder for that signal to travel. So what ends up happening is I have to have these voltage-gated sodium channels really close to each other along this axon. I have to have a whole lot of places where I remake my potential where I rush in sodium and then I spit back out potassium, I've got to do that really close together to each other all over my membrane. So the word we use to describe the way that an unmyelinated neuron sends its, its messages, we call this continuous, continuous conduction, meaning every single part of my membrane has to depolarize. I have to do this everywhere. The analogy that I, that I gave you guys in the guided lesson is imagine that you are walking down the hallway in Science West, back in our science building, and let's say for you to be able to walk down that hallway, you have to open and then close every single door on both sides of the hallway. Um, that's what it's like when we're doing continuous conduction. Every single place on my membrane has to depolarize. I have to open and close every single door, so depolarize it, repolarize it every single time um, for me to be able to move this message along. Continuous conduction is slow um, because I have to keep making that signal. Now, if we cover an axon with myelin, we're wrapping it up, um, we're putting an insulating layer on it. So think of it kind of like bubble wrap or um, insulation like you put in a house. If I put this insulation layer here, um, a couple of things happen. The first thing that happens is I can't have leakage channels in the places where I have myelin because the myelin wraps around it. That means that it takes a lot longer distance-wise for my signal to get weak. 
So my signal stays stronger longer, allowing me to only have to rebuild it every so often. Now, the, the places where I rebuild it, here's a lab term for us here. The places where I rebuild my signals are the, the only places on a neuron's axon that don't have myelin. They're called nodes of Ranvier. Nodes of Ranvier. Little spaces right here. So the only spaces on my membrane where I do not have myelin are called the nodes of Ranvier. When I have a myelin sheath around my axon, the only places that I have to rush in sodium and spit out potassium are at these nodes of Ranvier. So I only have to reject the signal once in, in this whole distance that I went here, instead of having to regenerate it like three or four times to go the same amount of distance. So imagine you're running around in Science West and maybe we only have to open and close uh, every third door. We can go a lot faster if we don't have to go through and open and close every single door. By putting myelin around the axon, it saves me some of that time. I don't have to open and close as many doors to be able to send my signal down. So myelin, when I, I have wrapped a neuron in that, I call the way that a neuron sends its message, if it's covered in myelin, I call this saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction. We, we used a couple of different ways to describe this in our lesson yesterday. Um, sometimes you'll see it called jumping um, conduction because it kind of looks like my signal will, my electrical signal will here and then it'll kind of jump to right here to this node of Ranvier and then jump to the next node of Ranvier. Sometimes it's called jumping um, or, or what one of uh, your classmates called it yesterday. Kind of, it's kind of like leapfrog, leapfrog where you, you start in one place and then you kind of jump over somebody to the next place, build it here again, and then they jump over you. So the, the big idea is I can go a lot faster if I don't have to remake my signal every every two feet. If I only have to make it every 20 feet, that's, that's a lot faster for me to send a message. When you start studying the brain, um, we have places in the brain where there's a whole lot of myelin. The places in the brain where there's a lot of myelin, they're going to look more white because uh, myelin is fat. Places where I don't have as much myelin, so either I have neurons that don't have myelin on their, their axons, or when I'm talking about um, places like the cell body or the dendrites that never have myelin, um, those are going to be found in, in what we call gray matter in the brain. So we'll see this idea of, of myelin coming back in, in the brain chapter as well. What questions do we still have? We hit, hit all the topics on my list. So questions about myelin, questions about um, any other lesson, 10 stuff, um, or questions about lab. Can, we sh can you show me the leakage channels in the top image? Um, yeah, so the location of those leakage channels uh, those those leakage channels, we'll zoom in a little bit. They're not actually drawn on the picture, but imagine that right he, in all of these little spaces right here, all of this blue, we got leakage channels all over the place in here. They're just kind of a natural feature of, of membranes. They just kind of always have these little leakage channels in them. So anywhere you see this membrane, imagine that there's little leakage channels inside of it. The leakage channels are, are everywhere. They're all over the place. Pretty much in between. Yep, they're in between those voltage-gated channels. Absolutely. Yep. And, and so that's the reason that I have to have all of these voltage-gated channels um, because I have to keep remaking the signal because all these little leakage channels that are hiding in the membrane in between them just keep trying to, to basically undo the, the differences inside and outside of the cell. It's kind of like when you ask a child to help you with some kind of task, right? Like doing the dishes or going grocery shopping. It's like they don't actually help, but they, they like it. Not that I'm having any of those problems at home, right? I'm sure none of us. How many of us are, are at home with kids? Can you raise for me? How many of you have kids at home right now? Yeah, a couple of us. Yeah, so 
Um, sometimes it's like, yeah, I really want my kids to help me do something. Like I got to teach them and they got to learn to do this. And then there are times that it's like, but I really don't want to spend 30 minutes unloading the dishwasher. So they're just not going to do it today and I'm going to do it today and they're going to help me tomorrow. So, um, the leakage channels are kind of like that where they, um, they go through and kind of undo all the hard work that, that our, our voltage gated channels do. Uh, PR, Pilar asked how they remake the signal, um, how they remake the signal. Remember that voltage gated channels um, let in a whole bunch of stuff all at once. Um, so when I say remake the signal, what I mean by that is we rush in a whole bunch of sodium again here. Um, and then we you know, rush out a whole bunch of potassium. The amount of sodium and potassium that rushes in and out at, at these stages on my graph is not as, as high which is why that signal starts to look a little bit smaller. So all these places where I see the big white line, we brought in a ton of, of sodium. We, we spit out a ton of potassium with our signal. So they're remaking it in that we're, we're making sure we bring in as much sodium as possible um, because that keeps the membrane charge different, more different. Yeah. Yeah, children of all ages, I, I feel that. <laughs> All right, let me zoom back out. Other myelin questions or neuron questions? I did not do uh, this poll early in class, so I'll just do it here um, right now in the chat. Can you text me the day that you uh, normally had lecture? So. MW for my Monday, Wednesdays, uh, TT, I guess, for Tuesday, Thursday, or, or F for my Fridays. I want to see um, what kind of a spread we've got here. Okay, lots of Fridays, lots of Monday, Wednesdays. Okay, a couple Tuesday, Thursdays. Um, help me out, especially I'm most interested in my friends from Friday. Have you guys gotten some messages in the group me about the exam? Have you guys heard heard feedback and group me about about the exam for my Friday friends? Okay, I'm hearing a no. Have not. Okay, so what I'm here in the last little bit of time that we have is let's talk about the exam because um, I have given some information. I guess I didn't have Friday friends here when I did that. So, all right, here we go. Let's talk about the exam. Uh, exam number three. This is going to go live for you guys Wednesday, April 8th at 7.30 a.m. It will be available for you to complete until Friday, April 10th at 11.59 p.m. But here's what I will say. I am not going to take late submissions, so pretend like your due date is by 11.30 p.m. that night. Give yourself wiggle room. If you're taking it at night, take it early. Uh, the way the exam is going to be structured is you will get one minute question. Um, it's not going to make you sit and stare at a question you've answered. Uh, what that means is I I'm guessing we're going to have about 60 questions. That's my weekend project is, is writing your exam. So uh, probably about 60 questions. Um, you're going to have 60 minutes on a timer to, to take this exam. You uh, get one attempt on the exam. Um, when you take the exam, it's not going to give you feedback because I've got neighbors who are taking the exam. Um, we will we'll talk about how to do feedback after everyone's taken it. We'll, we'll talk about how you can get some feedback on the exam. Um, for the exam, it's going to show you one question at a time. Um, so what I've been talking about during office hours this week is that I'm going to try to set you up just like a, a, a play quiz, if you will. I don't know. Uh, it's going to have stupid questions like, what's my favorite system? Um, and I'm going to show you what it, it looks like, feels like when you've got a timer on and when it's just one question at a time. Um, you will still have the ability to go back to questions. Um, somebody asked me, so can I go back and change answers? You can, but remember, I always recommend to go with your gut. So don't change answers unless you have a really good reason to uh, to change an answer. You will be able to go back and and and, and look at your answers from before, though, or change them if you want to. So, um, again, exam is going to be in the ballpark 
of probably about 60 questions. I will on Monday, and I'll let you guys know for sure um, how many questions it will be. However many questions it is, that is the number of minutes that you'll get on it. Um, with it being one attempt, what I'll say about that too uh, is you need to do it in one sitting. One sitting. Meaning you need to, to block off a time in your schedule. So I'm giving you giving you lots of, of opportunities here to, to get some child care, to find a time when your house is going to be quiet. Once you open up that exam, the clock is going to start and it's going to keep rolling until the end of the exam. So don't exit out of your window. Don't leave because it will submit your exam when you leave. So you need to do it sitting down and in one sitting. You get one attempt on it. Um, I've been telling students plan to give yourself like an hour and a half uh, window where that'll give you time to log into your computer, get set up at your computer, then start that exam um, in, in peace and quiet. So especially for those of you that, that said you're having, having, um, having kids at home, right? Um, make sure that you have plenty of time for that. Um, Pilar asked about the length of the questions. There won't be, um, a, a, the, the questions won't be super long. That is correct. They're not going to be um, a lot of long and involved questions. There will be a, a few that are, are application type questions, but it's not going to be um, really long questions like we sometimes do in, in the lessons or like we sometimes have done on the homework. Um, what happens if you're not able to answer a question in that time frame? Uh, I mean, what, what I tell you guys in class still applies. So if there's a question that's blowing your mind and you can't answer it and you know you've spent too much time on it, skip it and come back to it. You want to keep going on, on your test. So you're going to have that, that time window to complete that test. Um, do your best with, with your study skills. So if you know that right away I don't know the answer to this question and sitting here staring at it is not going to make it come to me right now, um, I am just, just make a note for yourself to, to go back to that one. Um, Mary Lou asked if you can flag the ones to come back to. I need to look at exactly um, what it looks like. I believe that you can, um, but if you cannot, I am allowing you exam to have a piece of scratch paper next to you since you're taking it on the computer um, and you can't, you know, like write on your computer screen. Um, I am allowing you to have a piece of scratch paper next to you. So if you know that question number seven is one that you didn't answer, you can write that on your paper and then go back to question number seven. Uh, Stephanie's got a question, or at least you raise your hand, Stephanie. You want to speak your question or just type it for me about the test? Or maybe you just bumped the, the hand button. And again, Mary Lou, um, a good way for us to find that out too is when I build you that, um, that practice quiz assignment, whatever, um, that would be a good time to look and see what that looks like too. I, I think I've used so many different online learning systems. So I can't remember for sure. I, I think the way it's going to work is that you'll have a list of questions over on the left side of your screen um, with the numbers. So I think that that you should be able to click on them to go back to them. Um, but again, that that was either in Blackboard or I, I have used a couple other systems, too. So we will all see together what that looks like when uh, when I um, put that up there. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be for a grade. If it's going to be for a grade, it's going to be like one point, like a one point assignment. Um, it's really just to give you a feel for what it looks like and what it feels like to um, to go in and take something that's timed, that you get one attempt and that it only shows you one thing um, because that's, that's going to be different than how we've always done our homework assignments. Yeah, so Stephanie you're, says you're a little bit worried about the timed factor. Yep, I, I get that. Um, and that's why um, I, I would say give yourself some good time to kind of get in, in the mental headspace. Um, so give yourself an hour. And a, if, it, if it's 60 questions, which like I said, I don't think it's going to be more than 60 questions. Give yourself a good 15 minutes to sit in front of your computer. Do whatever helps to center you. Do a little bit of deep breathing. Do a little bit of last minute reviewing. Um, Maybe I'll try to make you guys like a little memes folder or something like to look at and chuckle before I take the exam. I don't know. Uh, we'll see what I have time for, put it that way. Um, but uh, go into it and, and pretend like it's, it's a normal exam. I know it's not. I know it's different. Um, but, but pretend like it's as much of the normal class experience as possible. Um, I promise that I'm not trying to be evil. I promise I'm not trying to um, 
to make it harder than it needs to be. So I, I know that it's a struggle. Um, I know that that it's scary to think about taking the first one online. So um, try to figure out how we can can help ourselves between now and Friday be a little less stressed out or psyched out about it. Yeah, so um, Mary mentioning, um, you can see the board. Oh, so see the board here in our virtual office hours a little bit better. Yeah, things are a little bit bigger, right? That That's helpful. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm glad to, to hear that, that you've, you've been enjoying them. Um, what I will say too for next week, for virtual office hours, the schedule will post for you guys probably on Sunday. Um, I can tell you right now that Monday and Tuesday is going to be all about lesson number 11 because that is the new material on, um, on our exam. Um, Wednesday, I will probably do, I'm going to open up the floor. It's just going to be a, a unit three uh, review session in general. So any questions you have about any of the things that we did in unit three. So that's the muscular system. That's this neuron physiology stuff. That's the brain. Be thinking about what questions you have about some of those older ones as well. Those those two other lessons that we went to. That's going to be Wednesday. Um, so we'll probably do lab again on Thursday. Um, and then I might do another kind of general review on Friday. Um, but the, the main general review day for bringing your lesson 9 and 10 questions will be next Wednesday. Just as a heads up for you. Yes, lesson 11 is up already. Um, it's been up for about 11 hours. <laughs> um, I, I got it up late last night. I apologize for the delay. So lesson number 11 is up. I did um, post for you kind of like we did with lesson 10. Um, I did post for you an updated outline for lesson number 11. But what I will say is that um, lesson number 11 followed the, the online assignment followed your, your in-class outline pretty well. So if you did happen to already print lecture 11 outline, maybe start there and see if you can just fill that in because the lesson did follow it pretty well. If you hadn't already printed, go ahead and print the new one that's attached to the lesson. Um, Nicole asked about the, the lesson number 11 homework. Not yet. That's my afternoon project. So um, lesson 11 homework should be popping up. My goal will be the end of day today. So might be 12.30, but it'll be before I go to bed. That's that's my promise for you guys. So lesson number 11 homework will be up so that you'll have it this weekend to start working on. Yes. I guess I'll, I'll make a note just so that we have it too. Um, exam number three covers lessons nine, that's muscles, 10, which is this neuron stuff, and 11 which is the brain. And here's the good news about um, 11. A lot of the stuff in 11 is going to tie in very well with, um, with lab. So um, I'm, I'm glad that we had our brain lab this week where you started to learn those functions already, where you're, you're already identifying structures, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I think that compared to here with lesson number 10, where all this neuron stuff was like completely new, we hadn't covered it in lab at all. Lesson number 11, you're going to find has a lot more review to it. So I think that that will be helpful. I appreciate your comment, Nicole, about, about getting rest. Um, I hope to very soon. I at least I got to sleep in a little bit this morning, so that helped. I stayed up late and, and I slept in a little bit today. So um, And for my friends who have been, been tracking the back pain saga all week, I, uh, I went to my chiropractor again yesterday, and I feel so much better today. Today was the first day that I didn't wake up and like um, really regret not taking Tylenol in the middle of the night. So I feel so much better today. So um, that will help my my productivity and hopefully um, my ability to get rest um, once I, I get the stuff pushed out for you. So there's there's Dr. Aulis's update on her back that she's feeling much better. So that's good. Any last minute questions before I stop our recording? And what I will say, um, please, for my Friday friends that said you hadn't seen this information about the exam in the group me yet, please do me a favor and send that out to um, to the group me, to all of other of classmates. Please try to get this communicated. I will make sure to post an announcement about it when I post the weekly announcement for you. I'll make sure to post an announcement, and I'll probably post another one 
um, on, on Wednesday when the exam goes live. Uh, but please do me a favor and, um, and get this information out in the group me. Uh, Pilar, I'm, here we go. Sorry. I did not see that question. Let me go back and look at it in the lab homework. There are several markings that were not addressed in the lab packet. Um, I'm, do you have some examples of specific ones that you feel like were not addressed in the lab packet? Because the homework assignment was made based on that packet. See you later, Ariel. I would say that the packet is generally your guide. Um, but I don't think there should be, I don't believe that there's ones on the homework assignment that didn't come from, from that packet. Um, Sela Tersica, well, if that was not in the packet, that was an oversight on our part. And we did talk about it during, um, during office hours. So yes, that would be one that we definitely want to make sure we know. Yes. Make sure we know that one, even, um, even though that one, if it didn't make our list, I'm going to make a note to make sure we add that to our list. So I guess the short answer to your question, Pilar, is if it showed up on your homework assignment, yes, make sure you know it. Um, if it's something that's just on the labeled images and it's not on the list and it's not on the homework assignment, then don't know that. But if it did show up on the homework assignment, um, that means it was an oversight on our part that we should have should have added that to our, our list. If you think if you find other ones um, besides Celeterzica, please let me know, um, and we we need to get that lab packet updated for the next next semester. Okay, so we need to add the Palatine bone to our list as well. Um, yep. So make sure we know where that one is. Um, the trick with the Palatine bone is it makes up the hard palate, which is um, the the very back of mouth where your um, kind of, it, it's back behind your, your front jawbone. All right, I am going to, I'm going to cut my recording here.